pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Very good, sisters and brothers, this is going to be a introduction for this particular Bible study. Now, uh, these presentations are being uh, taped by Jay Hastings. Thank you, Jay. The viewing audience can't see him, but just recognize him. Thank you, Jay. And, uh, okay, let's hear it. Very good. Now, as I said, first of all, we're, this is going to be an important introduction because we have to have a vision of what we are about. Now, this is what I very often refer to as a yeshiva. Yeshiva is a Hebrew word, and very often people think that that is the word that is used for a Hebrew grade school. But actually, yeshiva means in Hebrew, sitting, spelled Y-E-S-H-I-V-A, sitting. And it's people come together, they're sitting together, and they are studying the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. And that idea of a sitting is important because it means it's a, an important sharing. There's something interesting that people keep missing. The single most neglected and overlooked phrase in the entire Gospels, all four Gospels, is the following. He sat down to teach. Jesus is always sitting down when he teaches. Sermon on the Mount, he's sitting down. In Capernaum, so many people have gathered at the shore. They're pushing him into the Sea of Galilee. It says he got into a boat and he sat down to teach. When I was at Christian Brothers University, uh, there at the chapel, they'd get a chair for me. I would sit down to do my homily. I would do it here, but unfortunately, one half the congregation wouldn't be able to see me. So, so I stand up at the pulpit. And so, welcome to this yeshiva. Okay. We need to have an important vision. Scripture is not a book. Scripture is not a book. Rather, Scripture is a place. I want to repeat. Scripture is actually a place where you encounter God and not only regarding the Gospels but also in terms of the Old Testament in particular. Scripture is a place where you encounter Jesus Christ. And that's not my personal idea. Jesus is going to tell you that himself in John chapter 5. It's interesting. Uh, I've been teaching that for a long time. Finally, when he wrote his encyclical entitled Word of God, Pope Benedict XVI mentions the same thing. So I'm glad after 30 years of saying this, a pope finally agreed with me. And... Uh, but uh, Pope Benedict quotes St. Ambrose of Milan, who taught St. Augustine. And he said that when you read the scriptures in the heart of the church, you are back in the garden with God. So it's very important for us to have a conversion of our attitude and our vision of what scripture is. We do not read about Jesus Christ. Rather, we encounter him. There's a big difference, isn't it? 
of the four Gospels, the Gospel of John is especially uh, presented for that encounter. The Gospel of John has more one-on-one -on -one meetings of Jesus with other people than the other, four, than the other three Gospels. A whole chapter, Jesus talking to one person. What's also interesting is that the Gospel of John is the premier gospel in terms of the faith and the presentation of the incarnation. That Jesus Christ, true God, has become truly human. So he focuses deeply on the incarnation. Now, very often, it's difficult for us to find our way in Scripture. And just like if you have a Google map on your iPhone, and you can get the satellite map, if you've gone somewhere you've never been before, you feel more comfortable if you can see where you're at and where you're going, especially on the satellite, correct? which is especially important for me because I'm familiar with Collierville and Midtown and Central Gardens and Bartlett is totally new to me. So I've got that, you know, satellite on all the time. So what I've done is I've given you a Google map for the Gospel of John. Let me stand up. This will help you to find your way in the Gospel. The Gospel of John is 21 chapters, <clears throat> and the first chapter is called the Prologue. We'll be doing much of that tonight. Then after that, chapters 2 to 10 are the earthly ministry of Jesus. Then chapters 12 to 20, it's the last week the life of Jesus. From the entrance into the temple on what we call Palm Sunday, the Passion, Death, Last Supper, Passion, Death, and Resurrection. And then, chapter 21, the epilogue. This is the famous one where Jesus is at the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he's actually preparing a meal. There's a fire. And remember he asked the apostles to bring in some of your fish, correct? There is a chapel uh, in, uh, on the Sea of Galilee that's called in Latin Mensa Domini. means table of the Lord. It's a small chapel. It's not it's maybe at best the size of the St. Joachim Chapel. In fact, I think it's a bit smaller. And it commemorates the scene where Jesus will say to Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, etc. And there is, and in front of the altar, there is an outcrop of bedrock in which they said the Lord had made that fire. And that uh, out slab of bedrock about this high coming out has been a place where Pope Paul VI, John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis have all prayed. It's also called the Chapel of the Primacy of Peter. And there is a statuary group that commemorates Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? It's a fascinating place. Now, you notice I left something out. Right down the middle of the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Look at it. How many chapters are here? See? Right down the middle is the famous scene. The whole chapter is dedicated to the encounter where Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. And so this gives you an idea of how to be able to find things, where to turn to, makes it a lot easier for you. Now, at this particular time, we're going to go through something else. <clears throat> and so, 
Um, I'd like the following uh, <clears throat> part. Uh, um, let's do the following. Uh, for the sake of the camera, I won't move around. Okay. All right. Uh, tell me what editions of the Bible you're using. What edition? Dewey Rhymes. Dewey Rhymes, okay. New Next American. one. New American. New American. How many here have the New American Bible? Does anybody have a different translation? Anybody have Dewey Reams, New American Bible? Does anyone have any other uh, translation that they're using? Jerusalem. Or Jerusalem Bible? New Jerusalem or the Old Jerusalem? I think it's the Old. Okay, the New Jerusalem. Oh. oh. I'm sorry. Okay. That one. That, okay. The Jerusalem Bible. Let me see it, please. Bring it over. Okay. It's got lots of papers in it. Don't lose my spot. Okay, you've got the reader's edition. All right, here we go. Is that a bad thing? Well, you're missing. The Jerusalem Bible has the best cross-reference system of any English translation. And the footnotes in it are the best. I like the footnotes. Yes, good. And, um, and so if you... Uh, so, if you didn't bring your Bible text with you, I'm sure you're going to use your iPhone, which is okay. And um, the one translation that is the second worst is called Good News for Modern Man, or Today's Modern Version. And the absolute worst is called the Bible Paraphrase. Because you're not going to be able to learn anything, really, but those two translations. I mean, you can read about something, but you'd be surprised how it's mistranslated. And um, also, you can bring a King James with you if you want to. And, but I really, or let me tell you about the Jerusalem Bible. There are three institutes that grant a specialized degree in sacred scripture. When I say specialized, I mean you don't go from high school to get a bachelor's degree there, okay? It's the Bachelor of Sacred Scripture, the Licentiate of Sacred Scripture, and Doctor of Sacred Scripture. People go for those degrees after they've already got a, a doctor's degree in theology. Only three institutes grant that specialized degree. One is the Biblicum in Rome, and that's done by the Jesuits. And in Jerusalem, there are two institutes. One is the Biblicum Franciscanum, the Franciscan, you know, Bible Institute. And the Franciscans are very much the archaeologists in the Catholic sites, the Christian sites in Israel and in the Palestinian Authority, and even in Jordan. St. Francis himself formed that province the Terra Santa province, Holy Land province. And by the constitution of the order and of that province, in order to maintain their vow of poverty, when the Franciscans buy property, they deed it to the Holy Father. However, by constitution, the Pope has to appoint the superior general of the province as the custodian. He has the one with that title, the custos. So the Franciscans have the management contract. That way, if there's any conflict between the Holy See and the Franciscans, they're not going to get hosed out of their property, okay? <laughs> St. Francis is really sharp, I tell you. you know, he did more than talk to birds, I promise you. So anyway... <laughs> And, but because it's owned by the Holy Father, those properties are considered extraterritorial properties of the Holy See. It's like the status like of an embassy or a consulate by international law. People don't realize this, the top of Mount Nebo, where Moses saw the Holy Land, the Franciscans bought that back in the 1930s from the King of Jordan. 
That was still under the British mandate, by the way. A celebrated mass up there. And the third institute is called the École Biblique. It's French. It was founded by Father uh, Dominic. They're all Dominicans. It's founded by Father Jean-Marie Lagrange in 1898. And the Jerusalem Bible is their project. It comes from them. And it's actually, uh, originally, it's all done in French. And then it's translated from Fran French into other languages like English. And if you look at the front of your Jerusalem Bible, you will discover that J.R. Tolkien was one of the translators. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And the New Jerusalem Bible is an update of the original English translation from the early 1960s. There are a few things that had to be adjusted in terms of the translation. So, as I said, so. But ultimately, I don't care what translation you've got. Because part of the fun we're going to have is my correction of all your mistranslations. <laughs> Because I use a Greek text. All right. Yeah. And so, 